Today's video has been sponsored by Fanhome to show you their amazing Build-It-Yourself Millennium Falcon. This highly detailed kit is made from pre-painted die-cast metal and ABS parts. All you need to do is assemble it using the included screwdriver. The final model is a movie-accurate replica of the one used in The Empire Strikes Back, and is even built to the same scale, coming in at 80 centimeters in length. There's even illumination for the thrusters, cockpit, and front lights. Check out the links below to start your monthly subscription, which includes includes the parts as well as instructions on how to put them together, and a magazine with all the tech specs and history you could want on every part of this iconic piece of science fiction, as well as other ships from the franchise. Every subscription also comes with a mini die-cast model of the ship, a mug and cap, and a binder to help you organise the magazines. Order before November 24th to receive a t-shirt, and subscribe via PayPal to get a backpack. Upgrade to the premium version to get a tabletop stand and wall mount. Check out the link in the description and pinned comment to start your model now. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hujiwana and today we're going over how to land on other planets, or moons or how to arrive on the surfaces of various celestial bodies from space, be it from orbit or some other trajectory. That bit at the end there is very important, especially for anything with any level of realism. Unless it's taking place around really small bodies, space travel tends to be at high velocities, and even orbits are just going sideways so fast that you miss the ground, so you need to slow down first. If there's an atmosphere and your craft is built for it, you can cheat a bit and use aero braking to slow down, but if not then you need to do an engine burn. This Speeds and orbits in general is often overlooked in softer sci-fi, opting instead for dropships or pods that fall out and go straight down. This can still totally work with realistic physics if you assume the mothership is just maintaining its altitude and sitting stationary in space. But if they were in a proper orbit and dropped stuff off, then this happens which is easily fixed by the entry vehicle doing its own deorbit burn. The next step to overcome only applies if there is an atmosphere, because you need to deal with the heat created during atmospheric entry. As the object is decelerated by the air, all of its kinetic energy has to go somewhere. It turns into heat. Some of this is from skin friction, but for supersonic travel most of it is in the shock wave that forms on the front of the object, which then gets radiated back out and into the object. Heat shielding is vitally important here and can take many forms, though largely comes down to either soaking up the heat with something like aerogel, or deliberately ablating away to take the energy with it. The shape of the entering object is also key, as it can be used to push the shockwave away. That's why the space shuttle orbiter's nose was round, to stop the shockwave from touching the wings. An interesting note here is that the vehicle's centre of mass, or COM, is also important since it's the point that the whole thing rotates around. Just like any flying vehicle, one going through entry has to be balanced around the COM for stable flight, which is even more vital for a vehicle where the heat shield is only on one side of it, or it's even deliberately unbalanced, as was the case with Apollo, which used an off-center comm to generate lift, providing a method of changing the steepness of entry just by changing the orientation of the pod. But all that danger and complication can be avoided if you have a capable enough engine, like the ISVs in the way of water. They use their gigantic matter-antimatter engines to decelerate from orbital speeds while still in vacuum and then gently lower themselves down through the atmosphere. This is easy work for them because they use interstellar-grade engines meant to run for months at a time. Next week I'll be digging Digging into this scene in more detail, subscribe now to be ready for that. The next step after atmospheric entry is continuing to slow down to touchdown speed. High speed drogue parachutes, deployable air brakes, or even deployable wings can be used here, and many of these can also double as control surfaces to direct the craft to its final landing site. As demonstrated by the ISV, propulsive methods can be used here rather than relying on the atmosphere, and are obviously required if there's no atmosphere at all. The final approach is then to either a moving landing or more commonly in sci-fi, a stationary one onto a landing pad or a clear space on the ground, preferably one without big rocks everywhere that can pose a danger or tipping risk to the vehicle. Just a note here, rocket engines are good at digging, so any landing site meant to be reused will need to have a strengthened surface with a blast shield to stop debris. Parachutes or even paragliders can work for either moving or stationary landings, but parachutes are far less controlled and frankly very uncommon in sci-fi as they are for single-use landings. They may also require require very short burn retro rockets that fire just before impact, as on the Soyuz capsule. 
Generally, the entire craft touches down, though if we go back to the ISV again, it does a sky crane thing, just like Curiosity and Perseverance, using big engines to hover before lowering their payloads down with a winch onto the surface. As the Mars rovers had a one-way ticket, their sky cranes were just disposed of, but the ISVs flew right back up to orbit. Controlled moving landers is standard practice for space planes, as they rely on moving forward to generate lift to stay airborne. In sci-fi, it's way more common to see uncontrolled moving landings, also known as crash landings, or if you want to be cheeky about it, litho braking. While on this subject, how many times has a ship been shown slamming into mountain tops and smashing rocks up while taking barely any damage or not having their trajectory changed by the impacts? No matter the type of landing, proximity sensors of some kind are absolutely vital here. This may seem obvious, but maybe your spacecraft is a piece of scrap held together by hopes and dreams, or the setting is very analogue in styling. The old Mark 1 eyeball is just not sufficient, especially on an airless, cratered landscape like the lunar surface. Check out this video from the Chang'e 4 landing. It's impossible to visually tell how far away the ground is because all the small and large details look exactly the same. And that's assuming you can even see what you're landing on, which may not be the case at all. So it's worth bouncing a signal off the surface to see how close it is to make sure you don't pull an oopsie. Finally, the touchdown itself is where the last piece of the puzzle comes in. Landing gear. Or not in many cases. Do Star Trek shuttles have them? Drop pods also often forego having any form of landing gear, touching down directly on their hull instead. A sea space plane or space sea plane would land on its hull too, though those are exceedingly rare. Regular space planes make use of wheels for moving landings for obvious reasons, though that's not always the case. For example, Avatar's Valkyrie shuttle always lands vertically, but still has wheeled gear because it uses a runway for takeoff to maximise payload capacity. Space planes are a particular niche of craft though. Any vehicle that comes in to do a vertical landing is more likely to use landing legs, and that is certainly the case for the vast majority of things in sci-fi. There's a big variety of landing legs out there, but one way to classify them is whether or not they're stowed externally or internally. External gear is potentially vulnerable to heating effects during atmospheric entry and can have a detrimental effect on aerodynamics, but internal gear takes up internal volume, though it can be used for a cool location if the gear is large enough. There's also the odd bit of hybrid gear where the skin of the vehicle makes up the foot of the gear. All the gear bay is shifted off to the side of the vehicle to keep the internal space clear. The penultimate type of landing gear is some kind of inflatable, most likely a single use one, but I suppose it's possible for one to be made that's multiple use with some sci-fi reasoning. These do the most decelerating when compared to the previous options, and this is where I bring up litho braking again, but this time it's fully intentional and part of the process, like with Mars Pathfinder here. The final option is anti-gravity or repulsors or some other form of hover tech that's used in lieu of any physical form of landing gear. No matter what the craft uses though, the final orientation of it is very important. Does it land vertically on its main engine? Does it belly land? If it propulsively lands, then does it have special landing engines? Or perhaps the engines rotate, just like on Prometheus or Serenity. Access to the craft's interior will change a lot depending on how exactly it's oriented when landed, which is of particular concern with something that lands vertically, since the crew section may be way up above the ground. Ladders or elevators would be required to get down from the hab, or you just find the perfect landing site with a convenient cliff at door height. If the craft is laid out with engines on the sides though, then the crew or cargo section can be placed nice and neatly in the middle with direct ground access. That is how to get from space all the way down to the ground, one of the most common things to happen in sci-fi that includes spacecraft, though which bits get used is really up to the specifics of the setting or requirements of the story. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our Space Fighter design reference book. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by giving us super thanks or by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters and thank you for watching.